Excuse me. Excuse me. Hello? Yes? What is the global food crisis? The global food crisis? Um, is that how around the world right now millions and millions of people are at sick or at risk of death because of the food problem? Yeah, that's it. Stuff like takeaway and pies and chips and chocolate and hamburgers and pizza? And how all that stuff is so cheap you just live on it and get fat and end up having a giant heart attack or something? No, no, that's, that's not quite it. Last night, more than a billion people went to bed hungry. That's one out of every six people on the planet. They went to bed hungry simply because they could not get hold of enough food. Not because they didn't work hard enough. Not because they don't know how to look after themselves, but because as well as their crops failing, the price of food has gone crazy. The world has faced crises before, but nothing like the global food crisis. Right now, over a billion people in more than 30 countries are fighting for their future. Amazingly, many people in countries which can help, like New Zealand, have never heard of the global food crisis. If you're one of them, don't feel bad. Because while the global food crisis sometimes sounded like this, it mostly sounds like this. What's the most important right protected by law? That would probably be copyright. Copyright? Oh yeah. Well, right now, major countries of the world have come together and are working together to fight things like you know, video piracy and illegal downloads. There's obviously a lot at stake. Yeah, billions. Of people? No, dollars. The global food crisis is pushing food beyond the reach of around one-sixth of the planet's population. Not because there is no food, but because prices have increased beyond what the world's poorest people can afford. This can be pretty hard to imagine. After all, if you look around, you can't really see the global food crisis here in New Zealand. You hear about the price of food in other countries going up. But a Big Mac hasn't gone from $4 to $8. A can of Coke hasn't gone from $2 to $6. You're not paying 12 bucks for a latte or a piece of sushi. So what's going on? The first thing to realize is that the incomes of the world's poorest people are incredibly low. A billion people are trying to live on $1.25 a day or less. As a comparison, the average adult take-home pay in New Zealand is more than $125 a day. But hang on, aren't things way cheaper in poor countries? For 50 cents, couldn't you buy a meal in Africa that would cost $10 here? Yes, things are cheaper in the developing world. But $1.25 a day is nowhere near enough to live properly on, especially when food prices have increased so much. A good way to understand what it's like to live with the global food crisis is to look at the percentage of income people spend on food. Here in New Zealand, we spend about 20% of our income on food. But for the world's poorest, it's more like 70%. Try to imagine handing over 70% of your family's entire income at the supermarket checkout every single week. What happens if the price of food doubles? You can't spend 140% of your income. All you can do is buy less. All you can do is eat less. For most of us, recent increases in the price of food mean we head over to the Tim Tam aisle and check out the latest flavor regardless. But for so many, the very same thing literally means a fight for survival. This is the sound of the fight for survival. And that's how you successfully do a Tim Tam slam. Hey there. What's the first world? Well, the first world is our world. That's where all the, not normal, but you know, average people like New Zealanders and Americans live. Why is it called the first world? Probably because we get everything first. What is the third world? The third world is basically the poor world. Places where they don't have enough food. I guess they get things last. So, is there a second world? Oh yeah, that's a website where you have an avatar and can hang out and do cool stuff. I'm pretty sure second world is only in the first world though. So if there's a first world and a third world, does that mean there are two planets? It's all one planet. They're just different worlds, that's all. The global food crisis is a series of forces and events which have combined dramatically to push up the price of food. This is why it's sometimes called the complex crisis. But the global food crisis is not complex to understand. In our market economy, food is simply a product. So an apple is just like an apple. Mac. And just like any other product, its price ultimately depends on supply and demand. Low supply and high demand always mean high prices. It's why diamonds cost more than pebbles. It's why a scalper can sell pink tickets for twice their face value. If you've ever lost a bidding war on eBay, consider yourself a graduate of Supply and Demand 101. One of the factors affecting our global food supply is something you would already be very familiar with. Climate. Unseasonal temperature changes and extreme weather such as floods and droughts have taken a heavy toll on the world's food supply. 
For example, billions of people around the world eat food made from Australian grains such as wheat. But due to drought, some of their harvests have been halved. In Africa, Kenya has declared a national emergency due to drought. In India and Southeast Asia, floods have destroyed millions of tons of grain in the last few years. When this happens, countries often stop or restrict the amount of grain they export in an attempt to ensure their own people are fed. This cuts supply to the world market and puts huge upward pressure on global food prices. It is predicted that as the climate continues to change, higher temperatures, drought and severe weather will have a devastating effect on the world's ability to grow and share food. What's that? It's the latest app for my iPhone. It's called iBloom. What does it do? Well, you have to grow the plant from a seed, right? To feed the plant, you shake the phone. To water the plant, you, you tilt the phone like a watering can. And to keep the air clean, you blow into the mic like this. Cool. Technology is amazing. App development, man. That's the future. This is the sound of a billion people eating virtual crops. The decline in agricultural research and development is another factor responsible for falling global food supplies. After World War II, a green revolution saw breakthroughs in technology and farming techniques which produced big gains in global food production. The results were so good that in the 80s, countries began to cut back on research and development spending. The effects of this are being felt right now as many countries use outdated methods, skills and technologies. They can't keep up with food demand deal with salinity and exhausted soil, or grow the kind of crops that can handle the erratic weather cycles caused by climate change. Every day, thousands of farmers in the world's poorest countries are forced to give up. They walk away from rural areas and head to cities to look for work. The movement of people from rural areas to the cities is known as urbanization, and it's a real contributor to falling crop production. Not only is the family no longer feeding themselves and dependent on the market, but land that could be used for crop production is sitting vacant. Hi, how much is a barrel of oil? About 76 US dollars a barrel. How do you know that? It's on the TV every night. What about a ton of corn? No idea. Why is that? I don't know, maybe it's because we don't run our cars on corn? The cost of global food production is strongly affected by the cost of oil. Higher oil prices flow into food by increasing the cost of petroleum-based fertilizers, increasing the cost of fuel from machinery, such as tractors and harvesters, and increasing the cost of transportation from the farm to the consumer. Basically, it costs more to plant the food, grow the food, and get the food to the people. There is a strong desire to move away from the use of fossil-based fuels such as oil, not only because of their increasing price and finite supply, but because of the effect of CO2 emissions on our climate. One response to this has been the development of biofuels. This is fuel made from stuff like corn and soybeans. It burns cleaner and is renewable. In many countries, including New Zealand, laws are changing to push people towards biofuels. About time, right? Well, the grain that makes biofuels is basically the same grain we eat. Last year, a quarter of all US grain was used to make biofuels. That was enough grain to feed 330 million people for the year. The next generation of biofuels looks promising, and we may soon be able to run our cars on a fuel made from materials such as household waste or algae. But right now, today, the bottom line on biofuels is that we are feeding our cars instead of our people. This is the sound of 330 million people eating biofuels. How do you visualize a billion people? Imagine a group of a thousand people. Now imagine a thousand of those. Now imagine a thousand of those. I still can't see it. Oh, okay. You know how long a second is, right? Well, a billion seconds from now, the year will be 2041. In 2041, the population of our planet will be tipping 9 billion people. Every year, 76 million extra new people are born. That's almost one and a half million new mouths to feed every week. This rapid growth in population is increasing the demand for food and pushing up prices. A change in the balance of the world's population is also contributing to the global food crisis. More than a third of the Earth's people live now in either India or China. And while people in these countries make up some of the billion hit by the global food crisis, there's been a massive increase in the middle classes in both. This means hundreds of millions of people with the money to buy better food, and more of it. This, in turn, is creating an increase in demand, not only for grain, but for meat. And one kilogram of beef needs seven kilograms of feed grain. So if you're poor and you want to eat tonight, you'll have to queue up behind us, our cows, and our cars. Why do you think the flower power generation failed to save the world? Well, you know that John Lennon song, Imagine? Yeah. 
Well, I think that's pretty much mostly what they did. Imagine. Sometimes you gotta actually do something real. What do you think happened to that generation? Dude, I think they became investment bankers. Usually the world has enough grain set aside to feed us all for at least three months. The global food crisis has seen that drop to its lowest levels ever. At one stage it dropped to about six weeks reserve. Think about it. That's not a lot put aside for an entire planet. Believe it or not, this is actually good news for some. It makes them very happy. It makes them very rich. If you know that rice, say, is in record short supply, and you know that people have to eat, then you know the price of rice is probably going to increase in the next 12 months. So if you're cashed up, why not make a big bet on it? It's called price speculation. Here's the weird thing. It can artificially increase prices. That is, make things more expensive than they really should be. If everyone thinks there is money to be made in buying rice, then more people will bet on it. So the demand will go up. So the price will go up. So even more people will want to buy it. So the price will go up again. And so on. Then, inevitably, the bubble bursts. Prices plummet. And the farmer ends up getting even less. Here's another weird part. When the price falls, the rich guys, somehow, they can end up making money on that as well. The bottom line is, instead of food being food, it's an investment. Here's the sound of someone eating an investment. Is there anything we can do about the global food crisis? Yeah, there is. We can eat our peas. People in wealthy countries like New Zealand are wasting massive amounts of food, more than we even realised. It starts with supermarket chains, which reject farm product that isn't perfect. Most supermarkets also throw out any food that has passed the best before date, even if it's completely edible. These two practices combined amount to a massive, pointless waste of the planet's food and put needless pressure on demand. But here's the real stinger. You and I, and most average people, throw away, every day, the food the world's poorest billion don't have. Last year, New Zealand wasted tons of food. We have so much food, we usually cook too much. Try and explain the concept of leftovers to a seven-year-old in East Timor who gets it one meal a day. Then tell them we usually throw these leftovers into the garbage bin. Maybe we could even tell them how often, when we come home from the supermarket, we can't unpack what we've bought until we throw out the stuff we bought last time, but didn't get around to eating. You can't mail your leftovers to East Timor. It's not about that. But we are helping drive up the price of food needlessly by adding to demand. We waste 20% of our food. That means we could buy 20% less. Less demand equals lower prices. Remember that supply and demand 101 course you graduated from when you lost that bidding war on eBay? Well, how would you feel if you found out the person who outbid you chucked the thing you really wanted in the bin? Lack of research and development, high oil prices, population increases, urbanization, growth of the middle class, biofuels production, price speculation, food waste, climate. It's a lot to take on, on $1.25. See? I told you the global food crisis was a complex problem that was easy to understand. Oh yeah, easy. Climate, oil prices, something, something research. The bit about China, eat your fish fingers, John Lennon. Exactly. A heap of stuff is happening at once to push food prices way up. At the same time, crops are failing. The bottom line is, over a billion people are hungry. Okay, maybe it is simple, but the answer can't be. I mean, apart from wasting less food, what can we really do? What if you were hungry as well? Me? Hungry? For what? Over a billion people are hungry as a result of the global food crisis. We can ask ourselves, where does the suffering end? Or we can ask, where does change begin? Are you hungry for change? <laughs>